Let me ask the sort of the ridiculous question of uh, which LLM is better at coding? GPT, Claude, who wins in the context of programming? And I'm sure the answer is much more nuanced because it sounds like every single part of this involves a different model. Yeah, I think there there's no model that Pareto dominates uh, others, meaning it is better in all categories that we think matter, the categories being speed, um, ability to edit code, ability to process lots of code, long context, you know, a couple of other things and, and kind of coding capabilities. The one that I'd say right now is just kind of net best is Sonnet. I think this is a consensus opinion. Our one's really interesting and it's really good at reasoning. So if you give it really hard uh, programming interview style problems or lead code problems, it can do quite, quite well on them. Um, but it doesn't feel like it kind of understands your rough intent as well as Sonnet does. Like if you look at a lot of the other frontier models, um, one qualm I have is it feels like they're not necessarily over. I'm not saying they, they train on benchmarks, um, but they perform really well on benchmarks relative to kind of everything that's kind of in the middle. So if you try it on all these benchmarks and things that are in the distribution of the benchmarks they're evaluated on, you know, they'll do really well. But when you push them a little bit outside of that, Sonnet's, I think, the one that that kind of does best at, at, at kind of maintaining that same capability. Like you kind of have the same capability in the benchmark as when you try to instruct it to do anything with coding. What, another ridiculous question, is the difference between the normal programming experience versus what benchmarks represent? Like, where do benchmarks fall short, do you think, when we're evaluating these models? By the way, that's like a really, really hard, it's like like critically important detail, of like how, how different like benchmarks are versus versus like real coding. Where real coding, it's not interview style coding. It's you're, you're doing these, you know, humans are saying like half broken English sometimes. And sometimes you're saying like, oh, do what I did before. Sometimes you're saying, uh, you know, go add this thing and then do this other thing for me and then make this UI element. And then, you know, it's, it's just like a lot of things are sort of context dependent. You really want to like understand the human and then do, do what the human wants as opposed to sort of this, maybe the, the way to put it is sort of abstractly is uh, the interview problems are very well specified they f lean a lot on specification while the human stuff is less specified. Yeah. I think that this, this benchmark question is both complicated by what um, Swali just mentioned. And then also to uh, what Aman was getting into is that even if you like, you know, there's this problem of like the skew between what can you actually model in a benchmark versus uh, real programming. And that can be sometimes hard to encapsulate because it's like real programming is like very messy and, Sometimes things aren't super well specified, what's correct or what isn't. But then uh, it's also doubly hard because of this public benchmark problem. And that's both because public benchmarks are sometimes kind of hill climbed on, but then it's like really, really hard to also get the data from the public benchmarks out of the models. And so for instance, like one of the most popular like agent benchmarks, Sweebench, um, is really, really contaminated in the training data of uh, these foundation models. And so if you ask these foundation models to do a sweet bench problem, but you actually don't give them the context of a code base, they can like hallucinate the right file pass, they can hallucinate the right function names. Um, and so the, the, it's, it's also just the public aspect of these things is tricky. Yeah, like in that case, it could be trained on the literal issues or pull requests themselves. And, and maybe the labs will start to do a better job um, or they've already done a, a good job at decontaminating those things, but they're not going to emit the actual training data of the repository itself. Like these are all like some of the most popular Python repositories, like SymPy is one example. I don't think they're going to handicap their models on SymPy and all these popular Py Python repositories in order to get uh, true evaluation scores in these benchmarks. Yeah. I think that given the dearths and benchmarks, um, there have been like a few interesting crutches that uh, places that build systems with these models or build these models actually use to get a sense of are they going in the right direction or not. And uh, in a lot of places, uh, people will actually just have humans play with the things and give qualitative feedback on these. Um, like one or two of the foundation model companies, they they have people who that's that's a big part of their role. And you know internally, we also uh, 
you know, qualitatively assess these models and actually lean on that a lot in addition to like private evals that we have. It's like the vibe. The vibe, yeah. <laughs> the, vibe, like the vibe. <laughs> the vibe benchmark, human benchmark. Yeah. The humans, you pull in the humans to do a vibe check. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of what I do, like just like reading online forums and Reddit and uh, X. Just like, well, I don't know how to properly load in people's opinions because they'll say things like, I feel like Claude or GPT has gotten dumber or something. They'll say, I feel like, and then I sometimes feel like that too, but I wonder if it's the model's problem or mine. Yeah, with Claude, there's an interesting take I heard where I think AWS has different chips um, and I, I suspect they have slightly different numerics than uh, NVIDIA GPUs. And someone speculated that Claude's degra degraded performance had to do with maybe using the quantized version that existed on AWS Bedrock versus uh, whatever was running on, on Anthropics GPUs. I interview a bunch of people that have conspiracy theories, so I'm glad you spoke, <laughs> spoke to this conspiracy. Well, theory. It's, it's it's not not like conspiracy theory as much as like they're just they're like they're you know humans humans are humans and there's there's these details yes. and you know you're doing like these crazy amount of flops and you know chips are messy and man you can just have bugs like bugs are it's it's hard to overstate how how hard bugs are to avoid. What's uh, the role of uh, a good prompt in all of this? See, so you, you mentioned that benchmarks have really uh, structured, well-formulated prompts. W what should a human be doing to maximize success? And what's the importance of what the humans, you wrote a blog post on, you called it uh, prompt design. Yeah, uh, I think it depends on which model you're using, and all of them are slightly different, and they respond differently to different prompts. But um, I think the original GPT-4 uh, and the original sort of predictive models last last year, they were quite sensitive to the prompts. And they also had a very small context window. And so we have all of these pieces of information around the code base that would maybe be relevant in the prompt. Like you have the docs, you have the files that you add, you have the conversation history. And then there's a problem like, how do you decide what you actually put in the prompt and when you have a, a limited space? And even for today's models, even when you have long context, filling out the entire context window means that it's slower. It means that sometimes the model actually gets confused and some models get more confused than others. And we have this one system internally that we call preempt, which helps us with that a little bit. Um, and I think it was built for the era before where we had 8,000 uh, token context windows. Uh, and it's a little bit similar to when you're making a website. You you sort of, you, you want it to work on mobile, you want it to work on a desktop screen, and you have this uh, dynamic information which you don't have, for example, if you're making like designing a print magazine, you have like you know exactly where you can put stuff. But when you have a website or when you have a prompt, you have these inputs, and then you need to format them to always work. Even if the input is really big, then you might have to cut something down. Uh, and 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 so the idea was okay, like let's take some inspiration. What's the best way to design websites? Well, um, the thing that we really like is is React and the declarative approach where you. Um, you use JSX in, in, in JavaScript, uh, and then you declare, this is what I want, and I think this has higher priority, or like this has higher Z index than something else. Um, and then you have this rendering engine. In web design, it's, it's like Chrome, and uh, in our case, it's a preempt renderer, uh, which then fits everything onto the page. And as so you declare, it, you decide what you want, and then it figures out what you want. Um, and, and so we have found that to be, uh, quite helpful. And I think the role of it has has sort of shifted over time, um, where initially it was to fit to these small context windows. Now it's really useful because you know, it helps us with splitting up the data that goes into the prompt and the actual rendering of it. And so um, it's easier to debug because you can change the rendering of the prompt and then try it on old prompts because you have the raw data that went into the prompt. And then you can see, did my change actually improve it for for like this entire eval set. So do you literally prompt with JSX? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
So it kind of looks like React. There are components, like we have one component that's a file component, and it takes in like the cursor. Like usually there's like one line where the cursor is in your file, and that's like probably the most important line because that's the one you're looking at. And so then you can give priorities. So like that line has the highest priority, and then you subtract one for every line that uh, is farther away. And then eventually when it's rendered, it figures out how many lines can I actually fit, and it centers around that thing. That's amazing. Yeah. And you can do like other fancy things where if you have lots of code blocks from the entire code base, you could use uh, retrieval um, and things like embedding and re-ranking scores to add priorities for each of these components. So should humans, when they ask questions, also use try to use something like that? Like, would it be beneficial to write JSX in the, in the problem? Or the whole idea is it should be loose and messy? I, I think our goal is kind of that you should just uh, do whatever is the most natural thing for you. Yeah. And well, then we, our <laughs> job is to mm -hmm. figure out sure. how do we actually like retrieve the relative event thing so that your thing actually makes sense. Well, this is a, sort of the discussion I had with uh, Arvind of perplexity is like his whole idea is like, you should let the person be as lazy yes. as he mm -hmm. wants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, that's a beautiful thing. But I feel like a, you're allowed to ask more of programmers. Yes. Right. Yes. So, like, if you say just do what you want, I mean, humans are lazy. There's a kind of tension between just yes. being lazy versus yes. like provide more as uh, be prompted, almost like the system pressuring you or inspiring you to be articulate. Uh -huh. Yeah. Not in terms of the grammar of the sentences, but in terms of the depth of thoughts that you convey inside the uh, the prompts. I think even as a system gets closer to some level of perfection. Often when you ask the model for something, you just are not, not enough intent is conveyed to know what to do. And there are like a few ways to resolve that intent. One is the simple thing of having the model just ask you, I'm not sure how to do these parts based on your query. Could you clarify that? Um, I think the other could be maybe if you, there are five or six possible generations given the uncertainty present in your query so far, why don't we just actually show you all of those and let you pick them? How hard is it to, for the model to choose to speak, talk back? Sort of versus, <laughs> that's, a, that's hard to sort of like yeah. how to deal with the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. do, I, do I choose to ask for more information to uh, reduce the ambiguity? So, I mean, one of the things we, we do is um, it's like a recent addition is try to suggest files that you can add. So in, while you're typing, uh, one can guess what the uncertainty is and maybe suggest that like, you know, maybe, maybe you're writing your API and uh, we can guess using the commits uh, that you've made previously in the same file that the client and the server is super useful. And uh, there's like a hard technical problem of how do you resolve it across all commits, which files are the most important given your current prompt. And we're still sort of uh, initial version is ruled out and I'm sure we can make it much more accurate. Uh, it's, it's, it's very experimental. But then the idea is we show you like, do you just want to add this file, this file, this file also to tell you know the model to edit those files for you uh, because if if you're maybe you're making the API, like you should also edit the client and the server that is using the API and the other one resolving the API. And so that will be kind of cool. As both there's the phase where you're writing the prompt and there's before you even click enter, maybe we can help resolve some of the uncertainty. 